Thanks so much for being here, guys. Really excited to talk. Very appreciative of your time. Um, wanted to start by just kind of reading some, some bios of, of who you are and some of the stuff you do, and then we'll dive into some questions about, about your work and some of the synergies um, between the three of you. So starting with Alexa, Alexa Big Wharf. Alexa Big Wharf is a mother to three wildlings. <laughs> They are. I love that. A mother to three wildlings, author, publisher, writer, entrepreneur, and podcaster. Her writing career began after her infant daughter passed away at two days old. She has written and or edited and self-published numerous books of her own and for other authors through her hybrid publishing company, Cat Biggie Press. She uses that hard-earned publishing knowledge to support other writers and small businesses in completing publishing and marketing their books through her company, Write, Publish, Sell. Mark Babbitt. Hello, Mark. Hello. Mark Babbitt is a speaker, author, and blogger who serves as CEO and founder of U-Turn, a social community for college students, recent graduates, and young professionals that Math Mashable calls a top five online community for starting your career. He is also president of Switch and Shift and CMO and co-founder at forwardheroes.org. Mark is the father of five. That is very impressive. How many boys and how many girls quickly? Three boys, two girls. So even father of five and a grandfather, he and the woman who tolerates him barely call Seattle, Washington home. Tanner Gears is a professional athlete, author, consultant, speaker, certified personal trainer and fitness nutrition specialist. Tanner's mission is to enable all women and men to achieve their goals in health and physical performance. After having the honor and the privilege to represent the United States on the 2012 national track and field team in London, Tanner's focus shifted towards reaching optimal health. Today, Tanner consults, trains, and designs customized programs for health, body composition, fitness, and physical performance goals. He also delivers motivational talks to schools, colleges, organizations, and businesses. Even though Tanner became visually impaired at age 21, he was determined to not be defined by his disability and still live out his dreams. Since then, he's graduated from college, helped develop software that enables the blind to independently solve mathematical equations, consulted architecture students to improve disability access, became a professional athlete, launched absolutelylean.com, and is living his dreams by helping others recognize and achieve their potential. And Tanner, I, I really want to start with you, put you on the spot here. I want to... I want to ask you about this idea of sort of waking up to your own story and your own life and then using that to, to help others transform kind of their lives. If you could sort of walk us through what, what this has looked like, looked like in your life. So like 45 minutes? <laughs> totally. totally. Like 30 seconds would be ideal. No, no. Yeah, no. Give me riff on it for, for five minutes. Yeah, so I was uh, 21. I was just getting my life together, realizing that, hey, I got to make something of myself. I'm not a kid anymore. Uh, yet, I, that's how I felt then. But now I'm 34, and I still feel like a baby. Uh, and uh, I'm excited about growing up. But I, uh, my life was kind of ripped out from under me. I woke up in a hospital totally blind after being in a really tragic car accident. A tree came through my windshield and paled me in the face, uh, broke my back in a few places, uh, ripped my, my head off to such a degree you could see my brain. It was exposed to the air. I had multiple brain surgeries. And then ultimately from the brain swelling, I, uh, my optic nerve atrophied. And so I woke up in the hospital totally blind. Um, then I had that brain infection that was kind of killing me. And uh, yeah, and so I, uh, my dad told me that uh, really made me shift my perspective to realize that my life still has value. It'll be up to mm -hmm. me to achieve it. And that's when I started going back to school, uh, started going back to work, um, you know, started some traditional more brick and mortar businesses, um, became an athlete at the same time. 2011 was when I turned pro and I was actually getting paid to be on the track. Um, 2013 is when I went online for the first time. And um, that's pretty late, Tanner. Yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you. So yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it. Wow. So, okay, so your dad helps you to sort of get out of this dark space you're in, but then when do you realize that not only have you gotten out of it, but you're actually able to help others? So when people started asking me to speak um, was kind of how that career got started, being a motivational speaker. Um, so I've been very fortunate to do larger organizations, smaller organizations across the nation. And then 
that was when it was like, whoa, like people want to pay me to just hear the story. And that must mean that it's not, they're, pay- they're not paying me for my words, they're mm-hmm. paying for the impact and the value and how you can shift someone's perspective into realizing what's possible for them. And that has a lot of trickle down effects for an enterprise, for a university, for an organization. So that's when I realized like, hey, I need to scale this and uh, figure out how to do it. I love that. So Alexa, you kind of also have a, you know, a part of your background is sort of about, or has been a bit about sort of turning um, a, a dark place into something that can um, help, help others through, through writing their story, essentially. I'm curious if you can sort of talk to me about your experience of, you know, first probably writing your own story and then learning to, to help others walk through that process. Sure. So, um, well, after my daughter passed away, she was actually an identical twin. So I had one that was still in the NICU for 84 days after that. And, um, there were a lot of issues that came along with trying to fight for a baby who was still fighting for her life. And, managing the grief and all of that stuff. And where I found my outlet was through my blog, where I just started to tell people about my feelings that I didn't feel like I could share out loud with other people um, and really found that it resonated with other people going through similar situations or people who knew someone who'd lost a baby and didn't know how to respond to them. So I spent a lot of time and effort kind of advocating and educating people on how to help someone who'd gone through that process. And then we put together a book for grieving mothers with a whole bunch of contributors. That's where I learned the publishing process. And I just found that I loved I loved sharing our stories. I loved the the release and the feeling that it gave us to be able to to share that with the world and to share it with the people who needed our stories. People started asking me how I did it, so I just kind of naturally grew into the process of helping other other women do the same thing. And now that's basically what my publishing house does is it shares stories of women who have a story to share, whether it's a personal tragedy or self-help or uh, motivation mm-hmm. or anything like that. And um, it's, it's just, there's something about, there's something about writing and Mark's a blogger too. I'm sure he can relate to this, but there's something about just being able to share things that you can't necessarily say to someone's face, but you can write in a book or you can write on a blog post or you can put out there in a different, a different um, me- um, format and still get your words across and impact people. And it's, it's been, it's been huge. It's been tremendous. It was the biggest part of my healing process has been reaching others and feeling like I'm helping them heal too. Wow, that's amazing. Mark, do you um, sort of what's what's your take on this idea of um, helping another person sort of recognize what they have inside them? Sort of how, how did you kind of recognize your potential and then start to start to change the lives of others? That's a good question. I, I got to tell you, when I, I'm old enough that when I graduated high school and I chose to go in the military and let them pay for my college, we didn't even talk about potential. Hmm. Right. Back then, back then, our parents, certainly our grandparents were still seeking that gold watch. Right. We're still um, just go get a good job. It doesn't matter if you like the work or not. Support your family, provide for your family. And and so as I went in the military, they said uh, we took, you know, you take all these tests. They said, oh, you'd be a really good engineer. I went, OK, that pays good. I'll do that. And that's exactly what I did. Um, and, and the Air Force paid for everything. And I and I loved it at the time. And then I, I did what all military trained engineers do. I went to Silicon Valley and had six job offers before I even left the Air Force and uh, did that did that for uh, eight years and threw my hands up and said, my God, this sucks. This is this is not who I'm supposed to be. And and I, I could just feel it. And I didn't talk to my wife. I didn't talk to my kids. I didn't talk to my boss. I just threw my hands up one day and said, that's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. I, I have to go find what my real potential is as a human being. Wow. And, and at the time, I'd, I had already been coaching uh, youth sports, and I got more pleasure from helping somebody learn the right way to hit a baseball or the right way to throw a football than I did it in any professional endeavor I'd been on at that time. And, and, and I wanted to feel that in my professional work. So, so I began 
living to work and er, in, instead of living to work, I began, I began making work part of my life journey and, mm. and helping a lot of others along the way. And I started hiring just because it felt good and because I was daily helping people and, and it, it turned my life around. And that's, um, that's still how we treat our businesses and our, and our people is it's, it's a lot more fun to give back and to help others realize their potential than it is just to go out there and make money. So Mark, what, after eight years in Silicon Valley, I mean, I spent six years in Silicon Valley and I had the same reaction, but I want to know like, what was it that was so bad? And then what have you been able to create with your work now that is so different? Oh, that's another great question. So, so for me, what was bad was, was the process driven cycles. Everything Mm -hmm. was about a a corporate bureaucracy and it wasn't about the people and it wasn't, it wasn't um, treating our customers right. And it actually happened after the Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, We, we, you know, power was out, lines were down, uh, our, our, our customers who had bought, three, you know, dozens of $3 million test systems couldn't get any support from us or anybody else. And, and we all sat around going, wow, what do we do now? We don't have a process for this. So I was a young manager at the time. I said, you all have company cars, start driving. You mm-hmm. pick a customer and go. Go visit them on site. Just go talk to them. Go, don't, don't try and solve any problems. Just go let them know that we're here, that we care. And, and, and that, that whatever they need, we're here to help them get back online as soon as we possibly can. And we all thought it was a great idea and the customers loved it. And I spent the next three weeks defending my actions to a very bureaucratic boss who was wondering why I would waste company assets like that. So that was it. That was my trigger. And I went, no, if we're not, if we're, if we're taking the human out of business, then we're doing something wrong. And I knew, I knew that wasn't the environment for me anymore. I love that. If we're taking the human out of business, then we're doing something wrong. Wow. Tanner, talk to me a bit about sort of the roadblocks that, that we find on kind of the, the road to success. You know, Mark's mentioned basically, you know, having coming out of the military, having all these offers in Silicon Valley, going to a place that probably a lot of people think of as maybe success, but then finding sort of this own kind of personal roadblock and realizing it's not for him what's your take on sort of roadblocks along the way and, and what do we do when those come up? Yeah, certainly. Great question. I love that Mark is talking about the relationships of business and how important that is. And when we're thinking about individual success and propelling ourselves forward, we often forget about the relationship with ourselves and the time Mm. um, and putting in the work to build that relationship with oneself you know it took me losing my sight to really look inside myself for the first time and see who i really am um and you know that's uh and there's only one way to do that um and it's through doing the work building the relationship with yourself and i often like to say that you know when we focus on the basics that's when the real um, door, the advanced things start to open up and the opportunities start to present themselves. And I've done it too, is that when we start experiencing the success that we forget about where we came from, we forget about that, the basics and those mechanical steps. We forget about the relationship that we built with ourself. And when we do that, it's really easy to fall off track. Wow. Wow. I'm just kind of taking that in. That's so powerful. How do we sip on that for a second? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) right. The the road to success is, um, is not usually a reflective one for many people. Totally. I mean, because we, we get caught up in the numbers right along the way, like Mm. we're looking for success and, you know, you know, Mark said baseball, base, you know, baseball was a sport that I grew up, uh, I loved playing. And when I lost my sight, I thought, you know, I remember digging around in my closet in this, in this moment of reflection, right, kind of coming to terms with oneself and the situation in which we find ourselves and where we're going to go next and how crippling that the weight that we perceive things to be. It's always tougher than it really is, but it's, it's, it's easy to say that from 
an ob observation standpoint looking from the outside in but i'm digging around in my closet and i find my baseball glove and i do what all kids do pretend to catch that ball i crow hop and throw the ball to home plate and make that big play in my head and then you know i take that glove off and i say tanner you know that part of your life is over and i put it back in the closet and unknowingly i'm i'm limiting my own self potential i'm i'm really feeling like the gravity of the situation thinking about the limitations rather than the possibilities four years later I step back out onto the field for the first time and start playing baseball for the blind. And, mm. you know, so that's, uh, and, and, and expanding on that analogy, you know, hall of famers. And when we get down to the numbers, hall of famers mess up, they screw up, they fail seven out of 10 and seven out of 10 times, three out of 10, they touch first base and, no one ever remembers the seven times that they struck out or didn't get on base. Everybody remembers and they go into the hall of fame because they won three times, uh, three out of 10. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's really tough to appreciate the, the victories um, mm. in the midst of all the failures. But um, again, getting back to the basics, um, that's how, um, that's how we, we overcome that crap. So Alexa, when you work with authors, how do, how do you sort of see their process work in terms of using writing to kind of overcome things in their life? Um, well, that's kind of usually what brings them to me is the fact that they have some mm. kind of a story that they want to share. So actually with a lot of them, we don't have to, to work through that because they already know that that's, so that's what they want to mm. do. But um, I will say, though, that what often happens with writing in particular, especially when they know that this is going to be a published book that everyone can read, is that they get scared they get scared of what the reaction is going to be from people. They get, um, I've had people ask me like, how do you work through the trigger points? Because as you're writing your story for a lot of people, there are certain elements of it that are really tough to sit down and explore and explain and continue pushing through. And, um, and for, you know, it's, it's, I guess I've been blessed in a way because for me, those were the easy parts. It was easy for me to sit down and write the hard parts because it was easier for me to say it than to write it. But I also found myself holding myself back a little bit because there are parts of my story that aren't so, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they make other people look bad, I suppose. There are some some situations where other people did things that really disappointed me or really hurt mm. me. Those are the hard parts. Um, so I guess mm. an, an answer to that, you know, I, I advise people when they're working through the trigger points and when they're working through the difficult parts to remember first and foremost, what is your goal? What, what are you doing with this book? Why are you writing it? Who are you hoping to help? Does what you're writing about in that particular situation help you achieve that goal of helping the person who's reading it or is it just something extra that doesn't need to be there it's that you know you don't need to hurt someone else in order to to get to your goal of whatever you're trying to achieve with with the book and then um to just write what they feel and let the editor help them weed through the stuff that doesn't need to be there <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know but they got to get it all out and then and then editors and beta readers and, and other people can help them say whoa that might be a little bit too far or you need more here or less there or whatnot so um but yeah in general just uh just being able to sit down and and and, and release it is massive so then, Alexa, how do you, because what's interesting is you work with people who, who come from, who are very clear that, you know, meaning is, is a part of their work, right? Their whole purpose in, in writing is they have some deep story they want to share. So how do you kind of um, help them to try to make that meaning sort of marketable or, or turning meaning into a business in a sense? Or how, how do you take them out of this idea that, you know, they're not just going to be writing a journal in their in their bedroom or something. Right. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, 
I, most of the time with a book of this nature, there's a l larger end game in sight that they may not realize when they first start writing their book. At first, they want to write the book just like I did. Like I, the, what triggered me to put together the book was um, a friend of mine lost or delivered a stillborn baby at 38 weeks. And it was about a year and a half after my daughter had passed away. And there were four or five of us at the funeral who had lost infants or pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And we were just kind of sharing our stories. And we we're like, wouldn't it be great if we could just get her to where we are now, mm -hmm. where we can show her that today sucks worse than anything in the world, but eventually you will smile again. Eventually you will have hope eventually. So that's where we came up with the idea for Sunshine After the Storm, a survival guide for the grieving mother. It's organized by tips and strategies on how to get through the stupid crap people say to you, like you can have another one or go get a dog or, you know, any of those things. So, so long, long story short, like when we got to the end of, of putting together that book, I realized that my bigger goal was to actually help people through the process and bring a little bit of encouragement to their daily lives. So I started a nonprofit for grieving mothers where we send care packages Mm -hmm. free of charge for as often as we can to moms who have just lost a baby to just give them a little bit of love and light. So in answer to your question, where I feel like I am actually in a good position because of the journey that I went through to help moms see how their book not only plays a very important role, for example, I'm working with someone who's writing one about postpartum depression and suicide awareness because her best friend committed suicide after going through postpartum depression. So I think I'm in a position where I can not only help her make sure that her book is positioned in the right place, but to show her how she can um, take that experience, that life experience and and, and she has actually started a nonprofit as well and a podcast and things like that to help be more than just a book that's on a bookshelf, but to help create a movement or a, or, or a, or a group. And it's hard sometimes because we are so niche, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because there are people that need your story. There's always someone going through what you went through. There's always someone who's going to be looking for your resources mm. and, you know. So sorry, I went off on a pretty big tangent no, there. But. That's amazing. <laughs> so Mark, kind of looking at it from the other side, how do you, when you're, you know, when someone is maybe starting out in a new career or, or starting out in a career for the first time post-college, how do you kind of help them to make sure that meaning is actually a part of, of the journey, right, for, from the beginning? Well, that's, that, there's the real key, right? Because so many of us, and it, and it still goes on today, we're not doing what we want to do. We're not doing what we think we should do to be helping others. We do, we, we strive to meet the expectations of those around us, right? Our parents, our significant others, our, our, our family legacy. And we, and we don't take the time, as Tanner said earlier, to build a relationship with ourselves to find out what it is that, we're, that, that we should be doing. Um, you know, we're driven by the, the pressures of so-called success. And, and uh, usually that's got a financial number attached to it or the uh, square, foot of your, square footage of your house or something. And we don't stop to think, well, what is it that would really make me happy? And, and so that's, that's where we challenge people. We ask people to answer two questions. And, and the questions are really simple. What am I really, really good at? And who will pay me to do that? And, and hmm. that's, that's so different than what do you want to be when you grow up? What, what school do you want to go to? What, what are you going to major in? When you understand the answer to those two questions and you forget all about that crappy follow your passion advice, which killed half of a generation of young people, <laughs> right? It was just basically just an excuse to go play uh, Call of Duty in your parents' basement until you were 31, <laughs> right? Mm. It, just, it, just, it just killed us, right? And, and so that's what we try and do. Now, once... You know, that's not, of course, it's not all, you know, Disney movies and puppies and rainbows. There, there are still going to be barriers in it, barriers to success. There's still going to be things in your way. But once you know the answer to those two questions, now you can start looking at things like, okay, what's going to stop me? Besides myself, wh what or who might stop me from, from realizing my own potential and, and, and actually incorporating my passions into, into the way I make my money? And, and there are some ways, sometimes where people go, well, look, I'm, I'm already like three years through an engineering degree. I'm going to finish that because I made a commitment to myself 
And I know I'll get to use that to create another waste, but I'm going to start a side hustle or a side gig, or I'm going to start blogging. Or I'm going to start writing. That's how I started writing. I, I was still an engineer and, and there was no creative outlet for me at all. And I, and I had a, a, a friend of mine that was a New York times bestselling author. And he said, I'm really having trouble with this, with this new book. And could you, could you read it for me? And I did. And I made a whole bunch of um, what he called acerbic suggestions, um, <laughs> which means I, which means I probably didn't go about it the right way. But at the end he said, this is, this is the best book I've written. Will you edit my next book? And so oh. I started editing and then I started writing and then I, I went through a divorce where, where, um, where I ended up with full custody, full, uh, full, uh, I mean, I mean, full custody, 24, seven, seven days a week of four kids from nine to one and a half. And I had no idea how to handle that. And I started writing to my friends and asking questions. And for the first time in my life, being vulnerable and, and, and taking on the, the tough conversations and, and, and that, that was my outlet. And, and now, you know, thousands of blogs later in a, in a, in a book later and me, uh, frankly, being uh, willing maybe to obliterate the comfort zones that were stopping me, uh, my self-created obstacles. Um, that's, you know, that was part of my new journey. And, and I think that's another big thing. And I know, I know I'm going on and on, but real quick, don't, the thing we tell people all the time is don't limit yourself to the journey you're currently on. Meet those commitments, you know, satisfy the people that, that got you where you are or where you're going but then start looking for something new. Your passions mm. are going to change all the time, yep. right? When you, the, like, for instance, me, all I cared about until my oldest was born, he's 30 now, was work. And then I had this little guy in my arms and I went, well, screw work. I'm not, I don't need to do this, right? And then, and then when I became a single dad, I went, well, now work has to change again because now I need to work from home because I want to raise my own kids. And my passions changed again. And then uh, I, I met my, my second wife, um, an amazing woman. We had a child together. I was 47 years old. I had a, had a newborn in the house. And my priorities changed again, right? And, and so mm. it, life is not linear. Passions are not linear. Success mm. is not linear. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come at you, and you better be ready for it. I do want to ask you to tell me a little bit more right now why that stupid passion advice is so stupid. Just because oh. I don't think, I think some people are still, are still wedded to that. They are. They are. <laughs> um, they're also wedded to all I need is a college degree and there'll be a great job waiting for me. And, uh -huh. and that's not true anymore, right? The, we have to build our personal brands. We have to know what we stand for. We, we have to do internships and apprenticeships and we have to seek good mentors. It's not all about the college degree anymore. We call that the big lie. Well, big lie too is follow your passion because yes, passion is important in your career and in your life. But in the meantime, how, how are you going to gain experience? How are you going to know what you like and what you don't like? How are you going to know where your fulfillment comes from? Uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't come from how much money you make or, or the prestige of the company you're working for. It comes from inside and it comes from you being willing to open yourself and up, up enough to help others. And, and so passion follow your passion, it really did become a substitute for work hard. And, and mm. for many people that, that became a trap. And, and we did, we spent way too much time, you know, seeking out the next college degree or, or trying to figure out what it was we really wanted instead of just, instead of just getting out there and, and living life and contributing to the world. And, I, and so that's, that's the problem with the follow your passion advice is go do something, go, go make fries at McDonald's and smile at somebody, go make somebody's day for four hours a day, just go do something in service of others and you'll find your passion You'll, it, or it'll find you. Yeah. I love it. Tanner, I, I want to sort of uh, wrap up a little bit in the next five to 10 minutes, but I'm wondering if, if you can sort of um, share a little bit about kind of what, what passion has, has found you lately and what you're really most sort of focused on right now. Mm. Thank, yeah, thanks for asking that. So right now I'm really focused on working with organizations to help motivate their teams to overcome obstacles and thereby increase their productivity and performance. Um, that is what I'm super focused on right now. Again, it's getting back to, um, I guess, I, I am most passionate um, on the cuff, like we are right here. You know, I didn't know any questions you were going to ask me going into this. And that's when we are our most authentic selves. Like if you're... Mm. you're truthful, um, then, you know, what's there to hide? You just show up to, with the sole intention 
to provide value, um, then great things are going to happen. So that's what I'm really passionate and moving towards right now. Makes me think of um, both what Mark and Alexa are saying is that, you know, when your intention is to show up and provide value and develop the skills in doing so, um, a, a huge obstacle that people have with that, a mental obstacle, is getting around this whole concept of, of working or providing value for free. Mm-hmm. and doing an apprenticeship, getting, developing, refining your skills, learning from the people, the shoulder, the giants that came before you so you can stand on those shoulders and create an impact that's in line with the mission that you have. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many opportunities are coming into my life right now. It's just amazing how the universe aligns itself. And mm-hmm. the major shift for me was being present and in that presence, showing up to deliver the most value absolutely possible without any anticipation or wanting to receive value in return or some kind of compensation. It's really just to have the greatest impact on everybody that's around me in every single moment. That is what really moves me every single day. Wow, I love it. And Alexa, what, what moves you these days? Um, well, I, I, I love what Mark actually just said about um, a few minutes ago about, you know, putting yourself out there and being willing to shift and to go with it because you never know. I mean, I, I actually am also an Air Force veteran um, with a wow. background in counterterrorism. I would have never found, never in a million years thought that one day I would be basically book shepherding women through writing their dreams and getting their, you know, <laughs> putting their lives out there for everyone to read and doing all these things. But I, I love it. I, I love the where life has brought me, even though I got here through a personal tragedy. I think that um, there's a lot of room for me to be able to show people that beauty comes from everywhere. And I think everyone here on this on this panel can attest to that. You don't have to take what life dishes you and and just let that be the end of it. Uh, we've all gone through some really, really challenging situations and come out better for it. So um, basically my passion is to help bring light and encouragement and all those, you know, woo-woo, frou-frou things that I never used to uh, pay much attention to, to, to just let people know that there is, there is hope and there is good and there is, um, there's meaning out there wherever you find that meaning and it can be what you do with your life as well. Um, so yeah, I think I answered your question there. I got a little excited for a second. Oh, but... I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> and, and where can people find you these days, Alexa? Oh goodness. I'm pretty much everywhere. Um, as uh, let's see, I guess the easiest place for people to find me is on Facebook and my Facebook page is Alexa big wharf and big wharf is well, it's spelled a L E X A B is in boy I G W A R F is in Frank E. And I also have a group for writers for people who want to um, learn the writing publishing process. And that's uh, on Facebook at groups and it's write, publish, sell very easy. And Tanner, just to go back to you quickly, did, did you tell us where people could find you? Yeah, th- uh, thanks for following back up with that. TannerGears.com is the best place to check out everything that I got going on. Okay, and Mark, tell us what you're really um, working on these days or focused on these days and where people can find you. Well, after swearing I was going to retire away from youth sports, I'm, I'm actually coaching my, my, my son's traveling baseball team. Um, traveling, playing. nonetheless. Yeah, wow. we, yeah we've, been, we've been to five, five, no, six different states now in the last several weeks that's and, um, and bouncing around in state tournaments this weekend. So that's my, that's my uh, short-term passion. Um, we have the second book coming out uh, next year, which I'm thrilled about, um, and, and the purpose is to help uh, uh, other old white guys realize that leadership is so much different than it used to be. And mm. we don't have to be those loud, autocratic, decisive leaders mm. that by being vulnerable and by being active listeners, we can change the, the culture within our company and grow better teams. And, uh, and finally we're launching, um, what U-turn is for college students to help them prepare for the, for life after uh, graduation. We're, we're launching our first nonprofit called forward heroes where, where we're going to help our military veterans, transition into civilian careers, perhaps a little bit more graceful than they're doing now. That's amazing. Wow. Nice. That's really amazing. 
Thank you guys so much. This has been super, super inspiring for me. I wasn't expecting to feel this sort of emotional at the end of this. So yeah, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Claire. You. This is great.